ACAST powers the world's best podcasts. Here's a show that we recommend. After three years, the world of the award winning horror podcast, The Magnus Archives, is back with The Magnus Protocol. Immerse yourself in a brand new terror and uncover the secrets behind the mysterious work of the Office of Incident Assessment and Response and try to find out what really happened to the Magnus Institute. Though remember that too many questions can come at a cost. The Magnus Protocol premieres January 18th, wherever you get your podcasts. Acast helps creators launch, grow, and monetize their podcasts everywhere. Acast.com It's Saturday the 3rd of February, I'm Kira Revens, and this was a week that saw Rishi have another tough week, a breakthrough in Northern Ireland, Big Tech in the spotlight, and Larry David strangling Elmo. No, really. Grab a cup of something hot, put up your feet, and get up to speed on the seven biggest stories of the week. This is the standout seven from the small seven. It's news, but not the news. PM Rishi Sunak had a tough start to the week with Tory party infighting, leading many people to wonder how long he will last in the top post. Business Secretary Kemi Badenoch and Leader of the House Penny Mordaunt have both been slated to replace him, but Kemi's ruled herself out of the running and said she's sticking by Rishi. I think it's really critical to remind people that there are 350 Conservative MPs. So yes, one person wrote an article saying that he was unhappy. I called him. Uh, after that and asked him what on earth he was doing because this is exactly the sort of thing that we have to stop doing in public. But to play all that in front of, <clears throat> excuse me, in front of, in front of the public is contributing to the belief that we are more focused uh, on internal matters than external matters. And that is not true. We are very much focused on the priorities of the country. That's why Rishi had his five priorities. But former cabinet minister and Boris ally Nadine Dorries thinks Kemi is really out for herself. Kemi Badenoch, Robert Jenrick and others, what they are out for is themselves. They are not out for the benefit of the individuals in the country and the citizens. They are serving themselves and Kemi Badenoch is one of those okay, people well, I would remind because they want to be both Prime Minister and Leader of the Conservative well, Party. Viewers- As we inch ever closer to a general election, it's clear that Rishi and Chancellor Jeremy Hunt are hoping a tax-cutting budget will win over voters. But well, those plans took a hit on Tuesday as the International Monetary Fund weighed in on the UK economy and cautioned against any further tax cuts. They're downgrading growth expectations for 2025 from 2% to 1.6%. 6% and IMF Chief Economist Pierre Oliver Gorinches had some very specific advice for the Chancellor. In the case of the UK you might think of uh, spending on healthcare and uh, modernising the NHS, uh, spending on uh, social care, on education. You might think about critical public investment to address the climate transition uh, but also to boost growth. Labour's Shadow Chief Secretary Darren Jones was quick to respond describing the intervention as yet more evidence of 14 years of Conservative economic failure. The end of the month brought Serious concern amongst businesses that new Brexit checks on the importation of goods from Europe are adding costs and delays as they were finally implemented on January 31st. Health Minister and Brexiteer Andrea Leadsom suggested that some friction was to be expected as the delayed rules came in, but that firms will just have to adapt and maybe buy less from the EU. Home Secretary James Cleverley took a more conciliatory tone and emphasised that the new checks are partly to improve biosecurity and avoid pests and disease entering the UK. We're going to make sure that these uh, sensible, responsible checks are done in a way that makes no interruption to the supply of food to the shelves. We, of course, want to make sure that we maintain uh, good quality food, and we've always been able to do that, uh, and we will continue doing that now. Thursday saw a fairly fiery PMQs as Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer hammered away at the Tories with a particular focus on the hardship that those coming off fixed mortgages are facing because the Bank of England has rates at record highs. Rishi fired back accusing Labour of looking to increase taxes and questioning the £28 billion green economy plan. And that's typical Labour economics because they want to keep the spending but drop the payment plan. It's the same old Labour Party, Mr Speaker. No plan and back to square one with higher Taxes. And to add to the economic woes this week, if you were one of the millions of mortgage holders in the UK hoping for a Bank of England rate cut on Thursday, then you'll have been disappointed. The bank's governor, Andrew Bailey, said that although inflation has fallen from 10% to 4%, the bank needs to see more evidence that it's on its way down to the 2% target. He didn't rule out a future cut which would help to drive growth in the UK economy. Chancellor Jeremy Hunt said the plan is to stick with the plan and had a quick pop at Labour. We've taken difficult decisions. The plan is working, but now is not the time 
to junk that plan by a big spending spree, borrowing £28 billion a year more as other parties want to do. We need to stick to the plan because it's working. Meanwhile, Labour's shadow Chancellor Rachel Reeves alongside Sir Keir Starmer was busy making their pitch to Britain's businesses at a special event. Reeves says Labour won't raise corporate rates or cap bankers' bonuses, while she also hinted that the £28 billion Green Plan could also be scaled back after relentless Tory attacks. Her message for business was clear. Know that in Labour, you will have a government that respects business, a government that will never put Britain's economic stability at risk. We will back British business every day and every chance we get. This week saw a breakthrough in Northern Ireland after two years of deadlock as the Democratic Union finally endorsed a deal offered by the UK government that would see a return to power sharing and devolved government in the North. On Tuesday, Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton-Harris, who has put a package worth £3 billion on the table, sounded relieved that there had finally been some positive progress. I'm pleased that the DUP have agreed to accept the package of measures that the UK government has put forward. And as a result, they are ready to return to the Northern Ireland Assembly and nominate representatives to the Northern Ireland Executive. The DUP's decision to accept the deal sees an end to two years of stalemate, but DUP leader Sir Geoffrey Donaldson was keen to emphasise the positives about the improved trade and the removal of restrictions on trade. And those who were predicting all kinds of outcomes that things would fall short, Well, I simply have asked people to wait and see the outcome. Thursday saw new legislation move through the Commons so that the Northern Assembly can meet, possibly as early as this weekend, at which point Sinn Féin's Michelle O'Neill will become First Minister. She said it's time to finally see power sharing in action. They are going to prove us wrong and come in and nominate alongside a Sinn Féin First Minister. I welcome that. That's exactly where we all should be. This is what goes to the heart of the Good Friday Agreement. The new bill will see routine checks removed for goods from the UK that are due to stay in Northern Ireland and also ensure the EU laws do not automatically apply in Northern Ireland. Both the UK and Irish governments are supporting the process and the Irish Thonishtov Micheál Martin doesn't anticipate any issues with the EU. This was Northern Ireland Secretary Chris Heaton-Harris as he introduced the bill to the House. With this package, it's now time for elected representatives in Northern Ireland to come together to end the two years of impasse and start work again in the interests of the people who elected them. And once as I hope they will be, they are passed by this House. I trust we will have the conditions to move onwards to see ministers back in post in Stormont swiftly. This week saw the aftermath of the provisional ruling made by the International Court of Justice in South Africa's genocide case against Israel and it was a pretty damning result. While they stopped short of calling for a ceasefire in Gaza, the court ordered Israel to take more measures to protect Palestinian civilians and prevent public incitement to genocide. It has made things awkward for some of Israel's allies like the UK and US who have both disparaged South Africa's case. South African President Cyril Ramaphosa explains why they brought the case to the ICJ. We are also a people who were the victims of the crime of apartheid. We know what apartheid looks like. Things escalated in the Middle East after a drone attack on a US military outpost in Jordan killed three American soldiers and injured at least 25 more. The US said the attack was carried out by Iranian-backed militia. It's the first time US troops have been killed by enemy fire during the Israel-Hamas conflict and US President Biden vowed to respond. One last thing. It's still not clear which organisation is responsible for the attack, but US Secretary of Defence Lloyd Austin, who returned to the Pentagon after a health scare, was clear that the US would act in defence of its troops. The President and I will not tolerate attack on US forces and we will take all necessary actions to defend the U.S. and our troops. There were some hopeful signs, though, as Qatar announced on Monday that negotiators from Israel, the U.S. and Egypt had agreed an outline framework at talks in Paris to be brought to Hamas. It could see a release of hostages, phase pauses in the fighting and an increase in the level of humanitarian aid for Gaza. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak was appealing for calm in the wake of the drone attack. We absolutely condemn what has happened over the past couple of days. My thoughts are with all of those impacted, those who have lost their lives, their families and those that are injured. We stand resolutely with our allies to bring stability and peace to the region and that's what we'll continue to work towards. 
Meanwhile, U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken weighed in on the row over the UN's Palestinian Refugee Agency, known as UN or WA. Ten Western countries have threatened to suspend donations to the agency following accusations by Israel that some UN or WA staff were involved in the October 7th attacks. We're going to be looking very hard at the steps that UNRWA takes to make sure that uh, this is fully and thoroughly investigated, that there's clear accountability so that this doesn't happen. Uh, Again, assuming the allegations are fully borne out. The UK's COVID inquiry continues to sit in Edinburgh and on Wednesday, former First Minister Nicola Sturgeon had her turn in the witness chair. The inquiry had already heard about deleted WhatsApp messages and allegations of burner phones, as well as messages referring to former UK PM Boris Johnson as an effing clown. So she was under pressure and in the spotlight. The counsel for the inquiry asked repeatedly whether or not she had tried to politicise the pandemic to help support a push for Scottish independence. She did admit to a series of errors, including her regret over a promise to journalists that her WhatsApp messages would be kept when she had already been systematically deleting them. She got emotional at one point when asked about the stress of being in government during the pandemic. I was the First Minister when the pandemic struck. There's a large part of me wishes that I hadn't been, um, but I was, and I wanted to be the best First Minister I could be. Outside the hearing, Amar Anwar, the solicitor representing Scottish bereaved families for justice, was unimpressed by her testimony. Nicola Sturgeon projected a daily image of sincerity in wanting to do right by the people of Scotland during the pandemic. But that carefully crafted image has been left shattered by the hands of Miss Sturgeon herself. Still to come on the standout seven, big tech under the spotlight and chaos as Larry David meets Elmo. Right after this. Being a winner on Valentine's is easy. It's flowers. Don't forget the flowers. Order early at 1-800-Flowers.com and you'll be entered for a chance to win $10,000 cash, a bouquet that's guaranteed to wow, and the chance at winning $10,000 cash. Just go to 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. That's 1-800-Flowers.com slash ACAST. No purchase necessary. Ends at 1159 ET on 2424. Open to legal residents at the 50 US and DC. 18 years of age or older. Sponsor is 1-800-Flowers, Inc. For free entry method official rules, visit www.1800flowers.com slash sweeps. Welcome back. There is bad news for Prime Minister Rishi Sunak as the House of Lords began the debate on the safety of Rwanda Bill on Monday evening. Former Tory Chancellor Kent Clark, or Baron Clark as he's known in the Lords, withdrew his support for the bill. He'd initially been on board as he said last year that he couldn't see any better alternative. But considering the bill as proposed, he objected to the notion that the bill would see Parliament overturn a finding of fact by the Supreme Court. And if we pass this bill, we are asserting as a matter of law that Rwanda is a safe country for this purpose, that it is always going to be a safe country for this purpose until the law is changed, and the courts may not even consider any evidence brought before them to try to demonstrate that it's not. Why big tech executives face the music on Wednesday as a US congressional hearing entitled Big Tech and the Online Child Sexual Exploitation Crisis. In attendance were Meta's Mark Zuckerberg and ex's Linda Yaccarino alongside the CEOs of TikTok, Snapchat and Discord. The hearing room was packed with family members and advocates all there to support the Kids Online Safety Act, which has been held up over safety and censorship concerns. Mark Zuckerberg did publicly apologise to the parents of social media victims after a startling opening statement by Republican Senator Linda. Lindsay Graham. Mr. Zuckerberg, you and the companies before us, I know you don't mean t- it to be so, but you have blood on your hands. You have a product that's killing people. When we had cigarettes killing people, we did some about it, maybe not enough. There's not a damn thing anybody can do about it. You can't be sued. When it comes to Seinfeld, co-creator Larry David, it can be hard to tell where his character Larry David ends and the real Larry David begins. He's been busy promoting, in a very Larry David way, the new and final series of Curb Your Enthusiasm and he just found himself in a truly bizarre cultural crossover. Sesame Street's favourite micro-muppet Elmo has been going viral all week as he tweeted, how is everybody doing? And got a lot of responses. That's how Elmo and Larry ended up together on NBC's The Today Show. But while Larry decided to strangle Elmo, well, I guess we'll never know. Chaos ensued on live TV. Wait. Oh, 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 o
ahead. Say you're sorry. Elmo, I just want to apologize. <laughs> thank you, Larry. That's very Elmo, big of you. Elmo, accept your apology, Larry. Cool. Okay, thank you, Elmo. Elmo. Thank you, thank you. You are such a sweetheart. Thank yeah, you, Elmo. Yes. Larry, you are not. You've been listening to The Small 7. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 a.m. Hit that follow button and have a great day. Give us seven minutes and we'll give you the world. Everybody loves a sequel, especially when it comes to the world's most comfortable shoe. Introducing the Allbirds Wool Runner 2, a next-level revamp of the cult classic. Seven years in the making, it's been completely reimagined for a game-changing fit and feel. With enhanced cushioning and super soft materials, the Wool Runner 2 delivers comfy all-day wear built for bliss. Visit Allbirds.com and use code FRESH24 to score a free pair of socks with purchase. That's A-L-L-B-I-R-D-S.com, code FRESH24.